What is a topological space? Well, in mathematics, a space is one of the basic objects that mathematicians work with. And there's this entire zoo of spaces out there, which each have their own purpose. Probably the most well-known space is a vector space. Vector spaces recover a lot of our common sense intuition about distance, direction, and orientation. A straightforward example of this would be R3, with an origin at 0, 0, 0, and vectors heading off in any direction. But we are not limited to this kind of space. There are other spaces, like metric spaces, Banach spaces for functions, or for quantum mechanics, we even have Hilbert spaces, or Sobolev spaces, which contain solutions to certain differential equations. The basic idea of a space, then, is that you have these mathematical objects with certain properties that live inside of a space. For example, a quantum state lives inside of a Hilbert space. But what does this all mean, and how do all these spaces fit together? Well, for those of you who have done programming, you're hopefully familiar with classes and inheritance. For example, if you have some animal class, you can make a mammal subclass, which inherits all of the properties of the animal class and adds a few new ones of its own, like the property warm-blooded, and so on. And there's no limit to the hierarchy that we can create in object-oriented programming. For example, we could then make a dog subclass, which inherits from mammal, which inherits from the animal class. In some languages like Java, there is a base object class that is at the root of all inheritance hierarchies. That is to say, all classes ultimately inherit from the root object class, which is the base class of all other classes. This is exactly the role that the topological space plays in mathematics. All other spaces inherit from the topological space. It is at the root of the hierarchy of mathematical spaces, just as the base object is at the root of inheritance hierarchies in Java. So let's start with a vector space. For example, we can choose R3 and think about our origin 0, 0, 0. All vector spaces have the property that addition and multiplication work in a consistent way, in the sense that you can add, you can do scalar multiplication, and the vector space is closed under those operations. That is, you don't leave the space, you stay within it. If we zoom out to a metric space, we lose the guarantee that addition and scalar multiplication will work in the usual way. All we are left with is a notion of distance. So every metric space has the property that you can define exactly a distance between any two points in that space. And that distance is the same whether you take it starting from point x to point y, or you start at point y and go to point x. So the distance is the same regardless of where you start, and that, that kind of corresponds to our everyday notion of distance, right? If you go from, say, Tokyo to New York, it's not more or less distance than going the other way around. Uh, but where a metric space becomes interesting is that although it does obey that property, that the distance is symmetric, whether you start from one point or another point, uh, you can get these very weird notions of distance that don't correspond at all to our geometric intuition. Let's zoom out even further to the topological space. We are now in a class of spaces where the very concept of distance no longer applies. Topological spaces do not make use of any kind of geometric definitions. Instead, they are defined using only the language of set theory. Consider a set with three elements, which we label 1, 2, and 3. Keep this example in mind, as we're going to come back to it. A topological space is denoted x, tau, and it has two elements. First, we have the set x. The second element, tau, is the more complicated one. It's a collection of subsets of x. Tau is called the topology on x, and the pair x, tau, is called the topological space. In order to be a topological space, the collection of subsets must satisfy three properties. First, the empty set and the whole set must be in tau. The second property is that any union, potentially infinite union, of subsets in tau must be in tau as well. And the third one is that any finite intersection, that is, if you take a finite number of subsets in tau, then the resulting subset, when you take the intersection of all these subsets, must remain in tau as well. Now, I'll be the first to admit here, this definition is concise, but it's not very intuitive. 
it's fairly straightforward to come up with some set x, and we just did so in our example of the set 1, 2, 3. But how do we create a tau satisfying these three properties? How do we come up with a collection of subsets of x that work? Well, there are two easy topologies that work every time. So no matter what set x you have, you can always take uh, either of these two topologies without really thinking about it, and you'll know that they'll work. So let's start off with the first axiom. So let's start creating our tau. So we know from the first axiom that the empty set has to be in uh, tau. So let's put that down. Now, we also know that the whole space x has to be in tau as well. And let's be lazy and let's just stop right there. And the funny thing is this actually works with the second and third axioms of the topological space. Because if we take any unions of these sets, we get one of those two elements, and we can just check that out. So if we take the union of the empty set with the set x, we get x. If we take the union of the empty set with itself, we get the empty set back. And if we take the union of the set x with itself, we get back the set x. And intersections work in a similar way. So we can see that even though this is a very simple topology, it does actually satisfy all of the requirements that we want it to have. This topology is called the indiscrete topology. Now let's try another one. This time, let's go in the other direction. Let's try to make our topology as big as possible, and we'll take every possible subset of x to be our topology tau. This is what's known as the power set. So p of x, where the power set is equal to every single possible subset of x. This topology is called the discrete topology. This one is a bit harder to prove, but it does satisfy all three axioms. So let's work it out for our three element example. So we have our set S, where the elements are indexed by 1, 2, and 3. Now let's take the power set of S. First, we have the empty set. Then we have all of our single element subsets. Then we have our subsets with two elements. Finally, we get the set itself, which is a maximal subset of x. This definition of subset throws some people off, but just remember that the empty set and the set itself are subsets of x. So let's do a few examples here. So let's take the subset 1 and the subset 1, 2. If we take the intersection of those two sets, we get back the set 1, which you'll note is an element of our tau. And if you choose any possible intersection or any possible union of these sets, you end up staying within the power set. There's no, there's no sets that you can choose such that the union or intersection of those sets is somehow not an element of the power set. So this is satisfied as well. Uh, another example of this is you could take uh, the subset 2, 3, and then you could intersect that subset with the subset 1, 2. And you'll notice that the intersection of those is the subset 2. Now, I want to make a bit of a distinction here. We want to differentiate the set 1 from the element 1. So that's a bit of a confusion, but it's, it's, it's important to make that distinction. Now, I'd like to raise an important point here. The indiscrete topology can be thought of as minimal and the discrete topology as maximal. That is, for any topology tau, any collection of subsets of x, it's going to be constrained to be between these two extreme cases. So the thing is, 99.9% .9 of the time, we're interested in topologies that lie between these two examples. Pretty much all of the interesting dynamics occur in this zone. The problem with the two topologies I've just mentioned, it can be thought of a bit of a Goldilocks problem. The topology on the left has too little subsets, and the topology on the right has too much. In fact, it has the most possible. For the most part, we need to find some kind of middle ground in order for the space to be mathematically useful. Topology is a fascinating subject, and the idea of a topological space is just the jumping off point. I hope you enjoyed the video, and good luck with your studies in mathematics.